I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about charging. And uh, first, I wanted to tell you a story uh, about charging. Uh, a few years ago, uh, somebody would come to us at Percona and say, hey guys, you know, I hear uh, all the cool kids uh, like Facebook or Twitter or Google employ some sort of sharding. So we also want to be cool and we also want to shard our application. I was like, okay, well, we can surely help you do that. But let's talk about your application first. Uh, what is your database size? Well, it's uh, about 5 gigs. Okay, uh, interesting. So, uh, are you guys like having so many queries? A single box can handle that. No, we have kind of, uh, you know, maybe less than a thousand queries a second. Uh, database is mostly um, idle. Wow, maybe you guys are growing like a thousand percent a week. Uh, so, you really need to be thinking about when you are uh, quite zillion of terabytes. Well, you know, we grew like 20% last year and we expect to do the same uh, the next, right? Well, with such numbers, uh, I would tell them we don't really need to shard for a very long time, right? Because 20% a year, even with uh, uh, Moore's law being dead, we still expect 20% uh, a year or more uh, improvements for, for quite a while, right? And I think that is a very uh, important question, what before, you can, uh, you really uh, uh, decide how do you shard, what kind of technologies you use, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, you better to understand wherever you need sharding uh, to begin with. And yes, of course, what we heard, for example, from uh, the uh, data stack uh, keynote, that is uh, all right, right? If you look at the large applications, we have to go and see how we can use uh, uh, multiple servers, but at the same time, we can go much further, uh, further uh, without uh, sharding those days, right? Really, if you take a look at uh, uh, what single box, single MySQL server can do, right? This is probably more than 100,000 of uh, queries a second. If you guys have seen from or Oracle keynote, they, sh they showed 1.7 million of queries a second, right? Yes, if it's very simple queries on very powerful uh, hardware, you can do that, but uh, 100,000 uh, a second, uh, that's very reachable and quite common on much more community hardware and even for uh, multiple queries. You can handle more than uh, the 100,000 rows updated uh, if you uh, need more than 5 million rows scanned per second, more than 10,000 connections for a single box, right? And you can uh, get more than uh, 10 terabytes uh, of uh, data if you uh, have, a, uh, have a big enough box, right? Yeah, so this is uh, uh, one of the uh, older uh, benchmarks uh, from Oracle, but as I uh, mentioned, even if you uh, uh, don't really uh, uh, look at those uh, uh, numbers, you can get more than 100,000 uh, queries a second. Now, let's do some, um, some math, right? Let's say you are built applications which has uh, uh, 3 million of daily active users, right? Well, that's pretty big, right? And if you think about users spending maybe 30 interactions uh, per user per day, and then we implemented that, so each interaction takes about 10 database queries, right? Oh, pretty, pretty cool numbers. And then if you guys think, well, uh, we can't really have our systems handle, uh, assume we're even utilization, let's assume our peak hours when, you know, folks are working or having lunch or in the evening is 3x uh, versus average. With those numbers, how many queries a second guys do you think you will need for uh, MySQL to handle? That's about 31,000, right? Well below what we, uh, what we see single box uh, can handle. So what you can see is what a single box really can uh, power uh, those days, quite uh, decent applications. Now, we know a number of examples uh, out there. One enterprise which really has uh, in the US which have more than 200,000 employees, 
deployed uh, Drupal, which is a pro the most heavily used applications for for all of their stuff, right? And uh, it's uh, deployed on a couple of MySQL servers, one used for uh, availability purposes, with utilization less than a 10%, right? Another, we see very uh, a lot of uh, e-commerce uh, Americans which uh, produce phenomenal, well, or pretty large amount of sales a month again with no uh, need for sharding. The thing you should know about the sharding, it is painful, right? So anybody sharded here? Okay, come on, don't, don't, okay. Was it painless for anybody? Oh, okay, painless for anybody. Okay, I see, I see. So why? Why sharding is painful? Well, a uh, few things. Uh, one is, if you look at the MySQL especially, sharding means development complexity. You can't really easily ac access all your data set uh, at once. You need to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, figure out what your access patterns are. There is going to be operational complexity, right? When you have a shards, you often think about how do you balance the shards, how do you split them, right, uh, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. You have to uh, figure out how to, to, to roll out the schema changes at scale, right, because you have to update the schema on all the shards independently and so on and so forth. There is also technology complexity because having a shard and you need uh, typically to introduce more, uh, more, more moving pieces uh, into the system. You also often have to deal with more complicated failures, right, instead of one box, being either up or down, you have to figure out, well, how does my application supposed to work when it is able to get some data but not other data, right? All of that uh, stuff uh, makes it complicated in terms of testing and, uh, and so on and so forth. Your also performance profile often becomes more, uh, much more uh, complicated because uh, uh, the, instead of just looking at one database which is performing well or being overloaded, uh, you may have some uh, very uh, funky relationships. Now, when you think about the MySQL sharding, I think uh, it's right to say it is, uh, it is especially painful. Because there are many uh, newer technologies that are really designed with sharding in mind. The MySQL was designed as a database for a single server, and then it was pretty much adopted by community to use that uh, user sharding, right? It was sort of bolted on rather than built in uh, in the engine, which makes it hard. Now, in your case, uh, the question may be what your application is way too large and you understand, hey, I will need to shard uh, sometime uh, in the future. Well, if you can't avoid that, uh, delaying it until later time may be a, a better choice, both uh, in terms of the technology available uh, at that time, right, because there is a lot of uh, improvements uh, in the uh, uh, last few years in the MySQL sharding technologies, as well as uh, simply you may have significantly more resources uh, to throw, throw about that uh, in the future. That especially applies to the startups, right? Small applications, a highly focused team who needs to really uh, be aggressive to succeed in the marketplace and win first customers, right? Later, when you get success, you, uh, you have uh, probably much more money, much more people to, uh, uh, to, to change things to shard, but you don't have to do it now. What kind of technologies uh, or strategies uh, exist to delay sharding? Well, here is the list, and I'm going to uh, go through them one by one. Now, if you, uh, first choice is the architecture, as your architecture applications. Wherever you are speaking about the service oriented architecture or uh, microservices, right, in many cases we see architecture patterns where it is many building blocks which each of them owns uh, their own data. Which helps sharding in two different cases. Well, first is uh, that means 
you have your data pieces being, uh, being smaller, causing less load and there is less potential need to shard. And then, as well, if you need uh, uh, ever to shard, then uh, that makes it much small, smaller problems, right? Instead of trying to have it problem for massive monolithic applications, which may be hundreds of tables with foreign keys, right, and other fun stuff, you may have just you know a couple of query tables which have a couple of query patterns, which may be much much easier to shard. Another piece what I uh, call is a, a functional partitioning. In many cases, uh, uh, we see that there are very clear different functions which operate on different data sets. So I'll give you an example for, uh, for Percona, right? We have our Drupal website uh, at Percona. We have a WordPress blog. We have forums, right? Really, those are uh, the independent applications which I can uh, keep separate, right? And if some of them would ever grow to require more load than single MySQL can handle, right, for three of them, I can potentially put it uh, in the uh, different location, right? It makes it easy, and it is, unless you uh, uh, introduce some dependencies between them, right? If I would say, oh, I now want to implement some WordPress plugin which are going to join the data from our forum tables and uh, our uh, Drupal tables, right? Uh, I just make it much more harder for me to uh, 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 to become uh, to split those uh, things uh, later on, right? So in this case, it's as basic as the don't hurt yourself. One of the practical approaches uh, is to make sure if you're DBA and you put uh, different databases on the same box, but you don't plan for them to be there forever. Make sure you create a different user accounts which only have access to your specific databases. So if you don't want your developer to join the tables from different uh, databases, they can't do that based on user permissions. Make sense? Now, uh, the other technique is uh, replication. Replication allows us to, uh, uh, to, scale, uh, to scale reads. The thing with a MySQL built-in replication to really mine is what uh, replication is asynchronous. That means uh, the reads you'll have are going to be uh, stale. Reading the potentially old data, sometimes the data is going to be old just few milliseconds. In some cases, it may be hours, right? The MySQL replication itself does not guarantee what uh, any, any any freshness for a data, right? So if you uh, if you want uh, something more, uh, you can check out uh, Percona XDB cluster or other uh, Galera based solutions. They can be uh, configured either to uh, guarantee you certain freshness of the data or to uh, to make sure you don't have a stale reads uh, uh, reads at all. The next technique, right? Caching. Caching also allows us to uh, to scale reads, right? And that's a very uh, uh, powerful technique, which has a, uh, a lot of uh, ways to implement that. Well, a query cache uh, in MySQL, well, uh, it uh, can be okay for uh, for some workloads, uh, but uh, generally it doesn't scale very well, right? I see that only as a Last resort issue, then you can't really modify the application and so on and so forth, right? Because it is pretty coarse, it has uh, bad overhead, it doesn't scale with multiple uh, cores very well. Uh, in many cases, we see uh, the cache is done on the application server, right? Especially when you have something which is persistent, like maybe Java, often it's good enough to preload some of the data instead of constantly going and uh, uh, fetching that from, from database. Memcache or, or Redis. That is a very classical thing that's used together with MySQL for cache and have been for a long time. Uh, anybody using, mm, using Memcache here? OK. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and. Um, 
So uh, yeah, that is a very poor, uh, very uh, common thing. So are you saying that's 10 minutes only? Okay, yeah, I was like saying, oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> I was thinking, wow, am I supposed to do it in, uh, in 25 minutes? I thought I, I have 50. Okay. Okay, okay, uh, anyway. So memcache, uh, Redis, other technologies for uh, caching can be, uh, uh, can be very powerful. Or often uh, you can do some sort of caching on the MySQL server itself, building summary tables, or there is also such technique as mater called materialized views, essentially pre-creating pre uh, uh, and caching some tables so you don't have to crunch a lot of data all the time to, uh, to get it, right? That's also a very uh, common technique. And then also caching on HTTP level. I think that is something which developers don't uh, backend developers often don't understand. DBAs don't understand because that's not their job. That's somebody else on the front end, right? But often uh, uh, folks which are doing that kind of development also don't set it right. So you have a lot of requests coming and hitting the app server and database server which don't have to, right? And if you would only had the proper HTTP expire headers, right, or, or only roll out something like varnish, right, or other cache, you would be able to avoid a lot of load uh, uh, the, on the database and keep users more happy, right? Because it's absolutely best if you have the data right there in the user browser and, and it doesn't have to even go and, uh, and hit your front end servers, right? So, uh, you know, to talk to your, uh, whoever is, is responsible for that in your team and see if there's any uh, opportunities for that. Queuing. Mm, that is another technique you should uh, uh, be aware of. And I think that's uh, very interesting for me what uh, uh, pretty much uh, all the big installations out there, they, uh, they use queuing for, uh, for certain things. For, uh, to scale rights, right, to kind of really balance uh, uh, the spike to, to batch work and, uh, and so on and so forth. To give you an example, right, of queuing, Let's uh, imagine there is going to be, you know, something, uh, 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 event happening, right? And we may have certain large amount of, let's say, tweets uh, injected in the very, uh, very, uh, very same second. If you try to process them and deliver them to everybody in real time, that's really very expensive, right? And maybe overload our system so we are unable to let people to even post their tweets. If you stack them in the queue, right, and then try to process them, of course, as quickly as possible, right, but make that delivering them to folks uh, asynchronous and make them deliver maybe two seconds or three seconds later, right, that's probably going to go uh, to, uh, to work uh, much better than uh, overloading the system, right? That is uh, one of examples what uh, queuing can, uh, can give us. There are whole bunch of solutions which can exist for different ways of, uh, of queuing, right? Uh, people are using Redis for that, uh, uh, RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ, uh, there is a zero MQ. Kafka is getting popular uh, those days. Well, and frankly, even if relational database is not great for, uh, for queuing, right? In many cases, just creating the table in MySQL and using that as a queue can really uh, uh, to help you to, uh, to, to, uh, to deal with uh, spikes uh, in, in your application. So uh, the next idea, going beyond MySQL, right? Uh, you guys probably uh, heard me talk about using right tools for the right jobs, and as much as I love MySQL, it is not the right job for, for everything, right? So there are whole bunch of different solutions which you, uh, uh, the, which you, can, uh, uh, which you can use and which are better for, uh, for doing certain things. Okay, the next thing uh, which is important is to think about uh, optimizing uh, things, right? Uh, in a lot of uh, cases, I see people when they have a spike, right, they uh, really kind of panicking oh my gosh, you know, I'm 
going to hit a wall. And either jump into getting much, much bigger hardware or uh, trying to bring in heavy alter like sharding, right? Instead of thinking, is there is something which I can optimize in my, uh, in my application? Now, in terms of uh, optimization, what we can do? Well, we can see how we can get more of the hardware, right? In terms of MySQL, uh, you often have to be looking at the CPU, right? Fast CPU, especially MySQL likes faster cores, right? You, because single thread essentially executes uh, on the single core, getting, you know, 60 slow cores is not going to, uh, to really benefit you, right? Uh, you want plenty of memory. The data which is in memory, it's much, much faster to access, right? Even if you have a very fast flash, data in memory is still going to be a couple of orders of magnitude faster, right? So it, it, it's really important. Third is if you have to use storage, use flash, right? Anybody is using the spinning disks for MySQL here still? Okay. Okay. Uh, why? Legacy hardware? Okay, well, I would say, you know, maybe you, you, bought, you made your last capital expert, uh, investment in hardware five years ago. I could understand that. But I think right now, last time I checked, the cheap flash is actually less expensive than server-grade spinning disk, right, per gigabyte. Right, so, uh, and if you are... Smart, you can often find uh, 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 find something. I believe what now Flash is cheap enough, so you want to run your uh, operational databases uh, uh, on Flash. Good network, right? That is uh, uh, this another uh, important piece, right? In a lot of cases, performance is really being limited by latency, especially if you're running a lot of short queries. A note in this case is don't only think about throughput. Think about the latency as well. Very often I ask somebody, hey, what is your network? Oh, I have one gigabit connection. Well, that's wonderful. I have one gigabit uh, at home as well, right? Uh, but what is, how far uh, is that, uh, what is the latency between you, uh, your client and server? Right, and they say, "Well, you know what? I have my server located, you know, thousand miles away, right? And I have my latency of twenty milliseconds. Oops, right? That is very bad latency. In uh, your data center, you should be getting uh, sub millisecond uh, uh, latency, right?" And uh, what you often want to get, if you have a control over that, to see, to make sure you have as uh, little hops out there as possible, and especially avoid hardware, which is kind of funky and complicated and introduces a lot of latency in your, uh, in your packets. Well, in terms of environment, Linux is the most popular operating system to run MySQL. So anybody runs MySQL here? Uh, not on Linux? Okay, what is it? Okay, double sorry. <laughs> okay, A any other choices? No? Okay, so we see majority uh, use Linux. Not a surprise. New MySQL versions uh, generally scale better with large amount of uh, uh, of uh, CPUs, they often ha often have more features, but be careful, right? Don't expect what your uh, queries to magically run uh, uh, run faster with upgrades. Many simple queries at a low concurrency, maybe even slower than new MySQL uh, MySQL versions, right? So uh, slightly slower, but still slower. So uh, keep it in uh, in mind. You know, MySQL five seven. It is a latest version. We have a Percona server, uh, 5.7, based on it with some more optimizations. So uh, check it out. 
Configuration. The thing to know about MySQL configuration what it is not designed, the faults are not designed for any uh, high-end workloads, right? Don't assume MySQL will sort of just take all the resources and self-configure that for a box. There are a few parameters you uh, want to make sure uh, uh, that you choose, right? And very easy link, uh, I did a whole presentation on uh, on tuning MySQL, and we also have a lot of uh, blog posts uh, on this topic and so on and so forth. In terms of storage engine, InnoDB is uh, the full storage engine MySQL, and uh, it works great. If you're looking for some uh, high compressions and uh, or uh, have a very right intensive workloads, consider TokuDB. Uh, that's uh, uh, storage engines which uh, uh, Percona is developing and uh, maintaining. Next question. Uh, then you are talking about sharding is how do you guys choose when to shard, right? And here is a question or trade-off. If you go ahead and shard too early, then you have to have all those pains of a sharding early enough, right? And sort of waste uh, resources, waste time. Now, if you run, do the sharding too late, then you can uh, run into a wall, right? And that is uh, not a good thing, right? Especially if you company just spend a bunch of money on Super Bowl ads, right, and you are running into a wall in exactly the wrong time. So, such things happen. So what you have to think about here is the uh, of architecture runway and consider sharding as a part of your uh, architecture in the future. So if you think about that, with your application, you can think, well, with my current architecture, without doing anything unnatural, I can probably scale 2x, right, of, or, or 3x. How much time it is versus how much time do I actually need to implement the sharding, right? If you think about it this way, uh, you can uh, probably take the right decisions for you. Now, what is interesting in this case is the time to implement sharding can so much, much worry about between the applications, right? I have seen the guys uh, say, well, how long is it going to be to implement your sharding? And the guys tell me, oh yeah, don't worry, we'll go work for a weekend uh, and it will be ready by Monday. And I would say, yeah, I heard that. But guess what? I've seen people actually do it, right? Some sort of very agile gaming company, right? Those guys, I mean, who have to uh, roll out the complete game in, I don't know, like a three months, they can sometimes uh, really implement changes uh, uh, very quickly. Now, if you look at some big enterprise application which was, uh, you know, built for last 10 years, right, and used a bunch of programming languages, very complicated relationships, oh my gosh, that may take a long, long time uh, 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 to short, right? So it may, uh, it may vary a lot. Now, we talk uh, about understanding, okay, you want to do the sharding before you hit the wall. And it is important, though, what you understand where that wall is. And that is where capacity planning is important, right? To make sure you do some tests with your application to understand what is going to happen when you have more data or more queries, right? Wherever you expect if your application uh, uh, application growth, right? And also mention two things. First, do not ever assume linear scalability, right? If you say, oh, I have only about 50% CPU usage, that means I can handle twice the amount of queries. I mean, doesn't quite work this way, right? Or same uh, for IOPS, right, or, or the, uh, anything uh, like it. Your scalability is going to be less than linear, that's for, for sure, how exactly it's going to look, that's uh, going to be very dependent. Uh, and also better be conservative in, in your app estimates, right? As you talk with uh, management, it's better you be very sure what application can work uh, at this scale, right? Because uh, if you mistake and uh, well, overpromise, then that's not a good thing. 
Now, what are the benefits of a sharding? And they, yes, there are quite a few of them as well. One is the sharding is what gives you the, uh, the ultimate uh, scalability, right? If you guys want to get to uh, something as a Facebook scale, uh, uh, right, then you have to, uh, you have to do the sharding. Now, what is interesting is in this case is, uh, I see people even using technology which have a built in, uh, a sharding, right? You think, think about Cassandra or, uh, the MySQL cluster. Many of them, I still figure out how to shard those things because, you know, if you have one huge system, which for example has a, you know, tightly coupled cluster, which has five petabytes of data in it or something, right? Think about it. What if, it goes on and corrupts your data because of some software bugs, right? Because none of the cluster is uh, protected from software bugs. Recovering five terabytes, five petabytes of data can be nasty, right? And take a long time. And then if you have all your eggs in one basket, then all your customers will be affected, right? And will be breaking your support lines, right? Complaining about why things are broken, right? If you have many smaller clusters and one of them, you know, dies for whatever reasons, so you'll have uh, less time to recover that and as well as less, most likely less customers affected and you can give them all the, uh, all the care you can need. Now, other benefits of a sharding. Uh, it often allows us to have a very compli uh, complex uh, caching layer, right? If you can shard, and uh, if, uh, if for certain types of queries, MySQL is good enough if you shard, you can uh, simplify your architecture versus, uh, uh, pretty well. Uh, right? It often uh, uh, allows you to uh, deal with asynchronous replication for, uh, uh, for scaling. I see a lot of folks who should implement a shard and then say, hey, we will do our reads and writes to one box because it's much more simple. We ne never have to deal with the uh, staleness of the data. And we would use our slaves for things like backups, for some analytical queries, right, and for some other things which is not production traffic. And we can run our production traffic from ma masters only because uh, we have sharded. Now, another benefit of a shard. It actually pro uh, it provides you uh, isolation which can be important for security, uh, for, uh, for compliance, right? Uh, and maybe uh, also to keep the data close to the users. Especially in some software as a service applications, may your users may ask you, I don't want my data to be mixed on the same instance with other folks, right? I mean, because you guys may screw up your application and I don't want accidentally, you know, things pop up, right? Or maybe you have, some bug and have SQL injection, right, and uh, to, uh, get exposed my data, right? So uh, that can be part of more security, that can be part of compliance, so the contract requirements. In some cases, that can also allow you to keep the data close to a user, right? If your application can be sharded pretty well, you may have some data close to European users, close to people in China, close to people in US, right? And especially in the current regulatory environment, that also may be a uh, uh, requirement of the countries you, you operate in. Costs. That's also important, right? You will see if a lot of uh, providers, cloud providers or so hosting providers, is uh, typically uh, the more powerful system they uh, are much more expensive, right? That is where those guys typically get a lot of their margin. Because typically when you need, we have no choice but to buy a bigger iron, you have no choice to buy bigger, uh, than to buy bigger iron. That means you're going to pay, uh, ready to pay for that a lot of money, right? If my application is shorted, I can uh, choose wherever the most attractive for cost performance, uh, right, uh, the, which my hardware vendor offers or my cloud providers offers uh, the, and what's not, right? This is, uh, can be very, uh, the, uh, very important. So, when do you want to shard? Well, first is when it's easy uh, in your case. 
right? For some applications, that may not be uh, too hard. For example, if uh, uh, if uh, you have some kind of software service, right? Your customers are already well isolated. That maybe is then scaling up is very in, uh, impossible or expensive. I mentioned the cloud, but I also uh, uh, see uh, that a common issue in enterprise, right? As a person here is being forced to run MySQL on Windows and on the spinning hard drives, yeah, I often hear something like, oh, you know what? 16 gigabytes ought to be enough for everybody, right? They're not going to let anybody to get a MySQL instance of more than 16 gigs, right? Or stuff like that. Well, sometimes it's easier to uh, actually shard than to convince your uh, IT department in the enterprise what that's. It's actually possible to, run, uh, to uh, use effectively, you know, 256 gigabytes of memory in MySQL, something like that. Right, or get a decent storage, right? Or if your application making sharding grow so imminent, it doesn't make sense for you to just go and uh, try to implement those stopgap measures, which you will have to maintain for a long time or have to roll back later. Just better to see it and, uh, and uh, implement a sharding. So there are a few things uh, you uh, can consider about the sharding. Let's go through them. One is uh, what I call the, uh, the sort of a level, right? How do we shard? And one approach is we shard that uh, uh, basically just on a database level. Another what I see is people sharding by what I call, would call the deployment unit level, right? When you say, well, I shard, but I have my uh, database, right? My application service, load balancers, right? Cache, all of those things. And I shard my, uh, uh, between those things, right? The benefit of that, uh, uh, of this approach is that means that each of those items is essentially self-contained, right? And there is uh, no interactions between them, right? Besides the, uh, the traffic routing. And whatever happens in one thing, whatever that's been uh, downtime, security, code bugs, doesn't uh, go through, right, to others because they are, uh, are absolutely uh, isolated. In certain environments, that can be uh, quite convenient. In others, uh, it's, uh, it's much better just to shard the database and maintain a very large kind of shared pool of uh, application service. Sharding key, that is another thing, right? Uh, when we talk about sharding, we shard by something. Maybe sharding by the user, right? Or uh, sharding by, uh, uh, by, you know, uh, something else. Uh, Typically, we want you to make sure is what sharding is set up this way so it's not too large uh, to, uh, in terms of a data size or, uh, or data load. So for example, sharding by user, and assuming no user creates you know, terabytes of data, is a good choice. Then sharding by country may not be so a good choice, right? Because there are some uh, countries are a little bit larger than others, and uh, you know, holding on Americans, all Chinese in one shard may be pretty tough. Also, uh, it often makes sense to shard your data in a different ways for different use cases, right? And, and double store, uh, store the data. To give you an uh, example, uh, the, a website which stores the social network based on the movies, right? There's lots of movies, and there is lots of users. There are two prevailing access patterns. If I want to see everybody's comments on a given movie, right, or I want to, mm, uh, you know, see all the, you know, comments and everything posted by a single person. In this case, it makes sense to double store the data so you can access it by, uh, using those two uh, primary access patterns the most effectively. Next thing. Now, how do we shard uh, in terms of sharding using? Well, it can be physical MySQL instance and schema or database, or you get the multiple shards per, uh, per schema. Now that's for real, right? Yeah. 10 minutes late, okay. <laughs> so uh, 
And then you have a physical database instance that helps uh, the isolation. In many cases, if you have some uh, software as a service with some relatively large enterprise customers, right, that is a good way, uh, way to go because that gives you a lot of isolation, a lot of uh, flexibility, and so on and so forth. If your users are uh, relatively small, right, you know, think about the Facebook, for example. Uh, it's more than a billion of those guys. We can't run a separate physical MySQL instance for each of them, right? Then one of those two makes sense. Typically, multiple shards, like multiple users per schema, uh, per table, makes the most sense because that's the most flexible. We can choose how large tables you want to have and so on and so forth. Shard equals schema makes sense when uh, you're using uh, something which is built on existing applications. So, for example, if I'm hosting a bunch of WordPress instances, right, then I would often give each of my uh, users uh, a separate uh, separate schema because in this case I can you just use uh, WordPress with very little uh, little modifications, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Haveability. Now, uh, Sharding means you have many servers, right? And uh, what that means, what the probability of at least one of those servers failing actually increases, right? So probability of all of them failing at the same time, of course, uh, of course decreases. And that means sharding actually increases needs for some form of availability, right? So often you would not shard across single MySQL servers if you have many of them. But you would shard in terms of some sort of clusters. Clusters being either some sort of master's, uh, master slave uh, replicated node, right, if MySQL replication, or it uh, uh, may be uh, speak C, Galera nodes, right, uh, stuff like that. You can shard over uh, any of those. Sharding technology. Well, few approaches here, right? Uh, a lot of people especially the big, famous companies right now, they're using their own sharding because they start implementing that uh, many years ago, at which time, you know, no good solution existed, right? Uh, there are also some other solutions. Uh, Vitesse, the guys from Google actually spoke on this, co on, uh, on this conference, right? You can probably maybe see, even still catch them and check out the slides. Uh, there are solutions being built like JetBands, uh, uh, Shard Query. There is Clustrix folks right there uh, on the booth which have a commercial solution, uh, which has a you know easy uh, built-in uh, sharding. There is a MySQL cluster, which is a, a, like open source kind of uh, MySQL variant with different. Uh, storage engine, but this is kind of uh, not very commonly used uh, uh, outside of very niche uh, cases. Yes? What's that? Agile data? Okay, so you guys also have some uh, sharding framework? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, if I don't forget, I'll add you to the slides for the next, uh, next one. Okay. Yeah, uh, by the way, the question, uh, how many of you guys uh, run in MySQL cluster here? Okay, okay, a couple of hands. And how many did you try, did try MySQL cluster? Okay, more hands, right? So, so that is what we typically see, right? I mean, uh, MySQL cluster is not easy. So typically we see much more people who tried it than who are actually running that, uh, that in production. But the workload, when it works, it works, uh, it works really well. Few other things uh, to consider, uh, which kind of a new, new one. Uh, MySQL Fabric, right, that is, and MySQL Router, that is a solution what the Oracle is, uh, is working on as a kind of official uh, answer for uh, sharding. I haven't seen that being very widely uh, adopted yet, and, and frankly, it's not very, uh, very complete. But that's uh, something which is in works. There was uh, a Tesor database uh, optimization, uh, database virtualization engine, uh, which actually had a pretty good uh, uh, sharding framework, but uh, I think uh, it's not been very actively maintained at this point. 
a scale arc. Also, so at the booth here, you can uh, talk to them. They have sort of MySQL proxy solution with some uh, basic sharding functionality. And also, our uh, community awards winning max scale uh, has some uh, very basic rudimentary sharding support, right, which, uh, uh, which can be used. So, in the summary, right, you can see what there are multiple technologies available for sharding in MySQL. Because it was kind of all organically developed over time, uh, but there is no kind of single solution which you can say, hey, if you guys have to be doing sharding, that is where uh, the, the technology you should, uh, 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 you should use. Well, uh, thank you, and I would be happy to answer your questions. Please repeat your questions for recording. Okay. Any questions? Oh, that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Uh huh. Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, that is a splitting of scheme and splitting of keys. That is a very uh, interesting topic, right? I mean, so I think it may, splitting your schema, uh, it, uh, uh, it, make, uh, it makes a lot of sense, right? And in uh, many cases, uh, that's actually maybe an uh, easier uh, project. The problem in this case is what uh, that often limits how far you can go, right? So, for example, if you have only five tables, right? And if, uh, I mean, even if you don't have any joints, there is a, at least only, you know, you can split it into five different chunks, right, first. Right, e, the, does that make sense? What's say? Well, uh, th this is an example, right? But it's still, if you have a hundred tables, then uh, it, it's a hundred. And this only assumes the uni no joints in universal distribution. Typically, you are going to have uh, one or two tables which will have a uh, large amount of traffic, right? Or, or certain uh, small tables, which limits how many, uh, how many blocks, right, you can e effectively get, right? Before we just, be, even single table starts to get so much workload, it still needs to be sharded. So I think that's the main uh, consideration for it. Okay, yes. Okay, so the question is about the methods of sharding and, and what uh, Pierre Corner prefers to do. Well, uh, uh, if you look at what, uh, uh, what you prefer, that uh, actually is, uh, it, it is application dependent. Uh, right, uh, very much so, because in some cases, uh, it's something they're uh, simply uh, modifying uh, application and having that uh, sharding logic in application uh, makes sense, uh, or in others, uh, that is a proxy-based uh, uh, solution, right? I think this is, a, this is the most uh, common one. In some other cases, uh, you, you would use some of uh, uh, the solutions uh, uh, like uh, my uh, my school cluster, but that would be in uh, in minority. Again, I think that is a uh, is a challenge. If there would be something like, well, that is solution, and that's the only solution you should use, uh, I would have told you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, you don't like me, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, and you're from Google, right? Well, not everybody is Google. And I'll even tell you a secret. Most people are not Google. <laughs> so, uh, yes, right? I think this is uh, always a good question, right? There is this kind of couple of groups, right? 
the companies which already got it right and have everything automated, right, and they have so many servers, they don't even think about doing things manually, right? But if you look at the, a lot of other applications, those guys still go ahead and, you know, install MySQL manually, go with their dirty hands, change my CNF, and you need to, to, to do that, right? If you have to do alter table on the five servers, they'll go ahead and do it one by one and probably forget one of them, right? So, so that, is, uh, uh, that is a challenge, right? You guys have already have an uh, operational culture at scale, so mm, in your case, you can deal with those questions because you already have to on some other systems. You, you don't agree with me? Oh, okay. Well, uh, th th uh, that's right, right? Well, and in theory, right, uh, uh, that is good to do things uh, uh, the, the phys anyway, but uh, in, yeah, in practice, it's kind of tough. Yes, that is a good point. Okay, uh, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Did I screw up on any other uh, things, statements? Okay, well, thank you guys, and uh, I'll be available for questions outside if needed.